All right, so today we are going to just do one quick over, oh my God, of overview of where we've been. And then I will cover Augustine. And from now on, the general drift of the class is to spend the first hour synthesizing getting your final wrap up on the previous class and then spending the second two hours, I will introduce you to the material. I will ask you like I did for today, out of all six or seven attachments, I just asked you to read the one, which was just newspaper articles. Um, so I'll try to make it so I don't make you read really complicated stuff before I even talk about it. So the last couple hours, we will talk about Augustine. And uh, then next class, we'll start with Augustine for an hour, and then we'll talk about Aquinas. Um, so let's just try it, see how the process goes. And if you have questions toward the end, before the end of the class, I want to make sure I've got everybody's questions answered about the process of the class. So we have three videos on the YouTube channel. And I did manage to, to link that, put the link on the Google Classroom stream. I hope everybody got that. And I think it works, it works for me. Um, there's a big irony in this. There's another Martha Beck who's very famous and she tells people you can do anything you want. The thing is between her and her husband, they have six degrees from Harvard. And somehow I think if you have three degrees from Harvard, it's more likely you can do anything you want, right? <laughs> but she sure tells people what they want to hear. Whereas what I tell people is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And here's all these people with good intentions driving us all to hell. So <laughs> this does not go over, right? Nobody cares about my stuff. I've never made a buck on my 16 books and 30 articles because nobody wants to hear it. But I'm going to tell you anyway. And today is just as good an example as any other uh, about how people have good intentions and they make big mistakes. Every single thing, every single behavior you would call evil while you're studying history was motivated by a very profound idea of the good. And I'm not quite sure you get that when you read history, right? Do you read history? Do you read what the people were thinking? And you can't write it off as rationalizing. They, I think it's much better to assume they honestly believed it. They were pure in heart. They were just ignorant. And so, I think the human problem is ignorance and whatever you call sin is a kind of ignorance also. It's just a subclass. So you do have to be careful criticizing people you disagree with, assuming they're cynical or corrupt or, you know, that there's some conscious awareness that they're bad. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> That's just not true. And so I'm going to make life a lot more complicated for you. And I, and you have to listen to this. <laughs> so uh, nobody would buy, you know, would pay to have to listen to these uncomfortable truths, I don't think. Um, all right, so let's start with, okay, guess what? In the process of changing meetings, I also uh, lost the classroom. I had it all organized. It was the best of everything, I guarantee you. 
but the best laid plans. Here we go. All right. Can you all see this? Hope so. Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. Okay. So the first day I talked about paradigm shifts. So we are going to talk about these switches in the model of the psyche. So today we have a paradigm shift from ancient humanism, which I will call spiritual humanism to Christianity. And I would, okay, a certain version of Christianity. All right, it's a paradigm shift. All right, then I started out, uh, I talked about Aristotle's virtues and the UN capabilities, which is a paradigm, but it's very Aristotelian. So many of your countries, the United Nations is involved and NGOs are involved and their goal is to maximize capabilities of, of people. So, um, so that's where it's relevant. And that's what I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But I hope you can link what Aristotle's doing to the United Nations overall mission to promote human capabilities, the opportunities for people to actually exercise these uh, virtues. And then the UN Declaration is officially uses the language of rights and that's modern language. So um, we, will, we will get to that as the class goes on. But what you want to think about is how often do you use the word rights and, and it does or doesn't correspond to capabilities. So I would like you just to think about that. Um, then we did this copy, okay. Now, a number of you felt like the letter from Seneca was really too complicated. And I understand that, um, but let me explain this just for a minute. There was one student. So I like it when students come to office hours and they, they explain to me what the problem is because I know that other students have the same problem. So another problem is I'm sending way too many emails and I understand that. Um, I just, I thought I had that solved by doing it like the other professors do it. Um, but what I'll do is I'll try to have my office hours at least be on this official page like we were we did it earlier because I don't have to record that and what that that makes it easier because then I don't have to send these messages all the time that you know it timed out after 40 minutes so I open it up again I don't I don't want you to have to get all that stuff so I will try to have the office hour just opening this standard, um, my regular meeting. Okay, but here's the Serenus. And the, what, the point I wanna make today is that I think this view is the foundation for Asia University for Women. I think everybody the person who founded it, the people who work as administrators, staff and faculty, all are spiritual humanists. And what that means is some of them are Muslim, but they're Muslim humanists. And some of them might be Christian, but they're Christian humanists, or they might be Hindu or Buddhist, or they might be what they would think of as secularists but they all focus on these virtues and they focus on cultivating these virtues in themselves and in other people. And um, if you think about it, the virtues of 
generosity and magnanimity. Uh, people have given a lot of money to found and run AUW. The virtue of rational ambition. So the people, the administrators, faculty, staff, they have talents, they've developed their talents and they want to use them for the benefit of the people who need them. So I think the people have very good judgment about mindful or wise ambition. Um, honor, I think that they honor the people they honor and what they honor, people who promote the capability development of young women. I think that's very honorable um, and it doesn't make you money and it doesn't give you power, but it's it, it should be honored. It should be honored a lot more than money or power. So you could think about that. You can write about that on your post that actually that is, those virtues are the, the tie that binds everybody here. And then on top of that, or in addition to that, they might identify with a, a tradition, but they can't identify with the intolerant version of that tradition, right? You wouldn't want an intolerant Christian or Muslim or Hindu coming to AUW and trying to convert people. Um, but on the other hand, we don't, AUW does not insist that the students give up their religion, right? As long as they can recognize that they identify with the branch of their religion that is humanistic. Um, and for the moment, I will say humanistic in this ancient sense. And you can decide for yourselves if it's humanistic in a modern sense. Each of you is going to come up with your own opinion. Now, the next point is that because AUW has these same values, you could imagine yourself, one of my students did, there were five students that actually posted already and one of them, and they do identify, they apply the material in really interesting and good ways. So let me just give you one. Um, she said that, oh, I gave advice to my friend recently about this because um, she comes from Kashmir. It's Falak, I don't know anyway, I just want her to know, I thought this was really good, that she had a friend because in her country, everybody is supposed to study science and they're supposed to go to med school or there's somehow science is going to save the world. And I've had students from Vietnam, Cambodia tell me that, that the, I don't know to what extent in your country or in your high school or whatever, people think science will save the world. On the other hand, in other contexts, people think science is destroying the world and religion will save the world. This is the class where each student gets to work that out. They get to read the material and think for themselves because this is a big issue in the world. Okay, so this, this one student said that her friend, her goal was to be a doctor, all of her life was structured she didn't pass the medical exam. She got depressed. She had no idea what to do. But uh, Falak, you know, gave her advice, which when she read the virtue, she said, oh, okay. I told her, know thyself. I told her, I mean, the whole issue is rational ambition, right? You were ambitious, you know, for the wrong thing. So you just have to find out what you're, talents and your interests are, and then be ambitious in that sense. Um, that's how you find out whether you should be a doctor or not. You try. If it doesn't work, then you look for some other capability because there are many, many, many things that we can do that are all really important. Um, so know thyself. Also, she said her 
friend was overthinking, right? You can examine, you know, too much or too little. And that was in this letter, it was, uh, if you run into troubles, you can't just go home and hide in a book, right? <laughs> you have to, you know, balance out your public life and your private life. Um, and the other point was that you can examine the source of your suffering, right? What, how is her, her friend suffering? Is it her fault? Is it, um, uh, you know, not her fault? She just didn't have the skill, the natural genetic ability, which it's not an insult, right? I could never go to med school. I could never get a PhD in math. There's nothing, nobody should want to be able to do everything because, you know, you'll fail. <laughs> So that's how you find out who you really are. And that, just learning how to understand that you're suffering because you had the wrong ambition, then you can accept that and your character can get stronger. So your character can get stronger if you figure out the source of your suffering, what you can control and can't control. And, um, develop yourself, right? Use these examples to strengthen your character rather than trying to do something you can't or just perpetuating the suffering. Um, then another student took, again, the example of unjust suffering and she had been, she's doing research on the way that the, the non-binary, LBGYTQ plus, non-binary uh, young people in Afghanistan are treated and they suffer unjustly, right? They suffer because of religious traditions and social norms. And this is a, this is a case where we have science versus religion, but there are religious traditions, the one that I grew up with, if the science says binary, non-binary is, is another way to be, and people have the same capabilities, and it's not a function of good and evil, well, then it's not. So the tradition I grew up in, united reason and faith, and the people I know in that tradition have no problem. But there are other people in the same denomination who have the problem, and they're duking it out within the denomination. But if you unite reason with faith, you shouldn't have trouble with accepting non-binary people. Um, let's see, who else? Um, oh, the idea of success, right? People have different ideas of what it means to be successful, ambition, and what should be honored. And so I said, you know, in America, uh, parents are considered successful if their children are rich or powerful or something like that. And she said her parents tend to judge whether they were good parents based on whether their children smoke or drink or have sex you know, outside of marriage. So that's intemperance, right? So if you raise self-controlled children, who pray, actually pray regularly. So that would be a sign of success because that's a sign of virtue. So anyway, that's good to figure out in what sense people and cultures are different and in what sense they're the same. So the ancient view gives you the same basic issue, ambition, because that's part of the human condition. We are social and political beings. We need each other in lots of ways. To be ambitious is to try and succeed at one of those skills or professions that people need that are part of the society. Um, so there's a, that's what's similar. Every society has people meeting other people's needs in a variety of different ways. What's different is in, in some societies, 
everybody's talents tend to go toward getting rich because that's rewarded. In other societies, everybody's skills tend toward cultivating a religious consciousness. So that's what gets rewarded. So that's what I do want you to think about. What's similar, what's different? What's the basic issue here? And what are the different ways that different societies develop it? Always, I would say, always go back to pleasure and fear because those are the most basic drives. And right now with coronavirus, fear has become a big issue and politicians corrupt people's fears. They use the fears, they manipulate fears in order to gain power and wealth. Um, capitalism, on the other hand, tends to exploit pleasure. And so you have all these advertisements of everybody's just happy and they have, you know, this wonderful material well being. And so to try and present that image, that's what you want and associate that that is your deepest pleasure is to be glamorous or to be rich or whatever. And then you buy products based on that. So, so this tendency to, I think you should go back to those two basic drives and then how a culture sort of moves up from there in terms of cultivating the virtues. But anyway, so next point is that if in your first paper, and it's not due for quite a while, but if you wanna get it out of the way, I think you could write a really excellent letter to a friend at AUW, because I think the culture at AUW tries to cultivate friendships between women that encourage each other to develop um, self-control and courage, right? The courage to be successful. Um, they tend to be generous with their time. They help each other out. They, they are all ambitious and they encourage each other to achieve at their highest level. They talk to each other about, well, maybe that isn't really what your gift is, or maybe that isn't what you really want. So you could try something else. Um, in, uh, excuse me, even in the US, students tend to come to college wanting to be doctors or wanting to be in the sciences. And every once in a while, they decide they really like the humanities. <laughs> of course, you can't get a job in the humanities anymore. So, but I do think humanities, obviously, I think they're important, this kind of reflective consciousness just somebody needs to teach it so that students can get things in perspective. Um, so rational ambition, you come to college and by the end of college, you should have figured out at least uh, for, for the time being, how you wanna move forward, what you think your greatest talent is um, and what you think you have to offer that you can do that satisfies you and also meets the needs of other people, your greatest contribution. Um, so, and then rational honor. I think you learn how to honor other women and you learn this whole different culture. It's a woman's culture where women are, are engaging and activating all these virtues in a way that when men dominate, before you came to college, men tended to control, right? What was, what was ambitious, right? What was successful? What was honored? It was all very tilted toward men. Men had more opportunity for higher levels of achievement and then they honored each other for their achievement. And it's this little <laughs> self-generating culture. But I, I think, AUW wants to create an alternative culture. And I think it's great. And uh, friendships, learning and anger, even tempered you. And again, in a, in a women's culture, there isn't as much to be angry about. I mean, when you're in a male culture, you get frustrated all the time. 
And uh, so once you get to AUW, you can, you know, relax and you can learn just the number of times when anger is appropriate is a lot less. And so you kind of learn how to deal with that. But friendships are really big and sociability, women not letting petty things bother them, not picking fights, you know, not competing for the male gaze, all that sort of stuff. And then truthfulness, learning, knowing yourself. Then also the women, they form their own organization. So they learn how to form a organization they create the laws, they apply the laws. And so it's like the, the clubs that they have are like little mini democratic societies where you learn how to govern, right? You learn how to make good rules or laws in your organization, you learn how to apply them, you learn how to whatever. Anyway, that is the point of liberal arts education in general is to cultivate these capabilities and send the students out as future leaders in their countries and in all different sectors of society. So, so if, if you would like to write a letter to a friend or just to my AUW sisters and get that out of the way, that would be your first paper and that would be great. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out is that this definitely is a conversation between men and at the time, it was only men who had these opportunities. It was only men who talked like this. Um, and again, it was dominant race and ethnicity men, right? They had to be Romans. They had to have a certain ethnicity. They had to have a certain amount of money. So there was all that bias, but there didn't have to be all that bias. Um, I'm just, you know, my goal is to say, hey, wait a second, the ideas are fine. The application of who gets included was completely racist, sexist, um, homophobic, class-based. So forget that, take the ideas and create a whole new culture that's um, women uh, helping other women and also, obviously, you have male teachers and male administrators, but they're all on board with this value of creating a women's culture. So, um, all right. And then the suffering part, I think, is really important for you to think about sexism. How much of your suffering is due there's, you know, you can go through all this. Do I suffer because I don't take care of myself and all that sort of stuff. Then you have natural disasters. Like I have a student. Um, yeah, Aurora made it to class, but she says there's a cyclone, right? So we have these extreme weather events. Uh, to what extent are they just accidental? It's just always been true because of the location. And to what extent are they made worse because of climate change, which is because of human choice. So we have to analyze all of that. Um, psychological suffering, uh, people, you know, hurt each other or they, they suffer because they don't know the place of human beings in the universe. There's all that kind of stuff, but what I was getting at was how much do you suffer because of sexism? How much do you suffer because of classism, right? Um, but particularly at a school for women, you do have to learn not to blame yourself for things that you didn't control and the cause was sexism. Or um, anyway, I do want you to, to sort that stuff out and get that straight. Uh, again, I'm not asking you, these posts could be like whole books because <laughs> there's so much you could write. But I do want you to give us get a sense of how on the one hand, this is a huge list, but it's part of your life. Like all of these things have happened in your life and life is very complicated. But 
the purpose of philosophy, one of the functions is to help you sort that all out. Um, okay, so that's enough on that. Um, and then the notebook entries of, I hope you can understand the difference between, uh, you know, today we read this and Augustine said, blah, blah. And somebody else said, blah, blah. That's just describing what somebody said. The second one is what surprised you and how does it compare, right? So what are you learning about mindsets? The third level of complexity is um, looking at a natural foundation and comparing what's natural, which is what I just said about ambition. We do need each other. We depend on each other in many ways. So different people choose different professions and skills and expertise to provide for everybody's needs. Um, so that's, there is a natural foundation and then there's unnatural, like a shoemaker that makes shoes that are good for people's feet. No matter where you live, people need shoes almost anywhere in the world. And people who are good shoemakers make shoes that are good for your feet. They're functional. And bad shoemakers make high heels with pointed toes and all sorts of dysfunctional stuff. Um, so that's the similarity and the difference. Um, and, and I again, I think you basically think like this without even realizing you're thinking like this but you do have to get these things straight. So morals aren't entirely relative. Some things are, um, it doesn't, you know, it's indifferent, but other things really are, there's a absolute, there's a pattern there that doesn't change over time. And then the last one is that you start to link your mind. How are you being raised how are you being trained academically? How do each of these capacities, intellectual capacities, link to your moral virtues and your way of life? And you link to your other classes, like what am I learning in my other classes? Um, how would Aristotle map that on, right? Where would that fit in this list of Aristotelian virtues and vices? You can um, think about, am I learning the class from a feminist point of view or is this class just completely indifferent? Is it claiming to be objective and detached and universal? Is it actually objective and detached? Uh, some of your classes really start out with, I know the names of them, right? Um, ecological feminism. Well, that starts out with obviously a worldview, a point of view, but there's other ones, you know, bioinformatics or something that look on the surface like this is true regardless of your, you know, gender, sexual orientation, whatever. And then you can think about it and see, is it actually the way we're learning it? Just like Seneca, Seneca's letter might look like it's not biased, but you know, the way that people who championed it, the way that they thought of themselves as virtuous and wise actually was very biased. And so Aristotle's, as I said, this view of practical wisdom was used as a part of colonialism for Westerners to justify their mistreatment of people in developing countries because they thought, well, we have all these capabilities and they don't. They don't have them by nature. Like we are raci racially superior. And so it was racist and it was sexist and it was, you know, it was bad stuff, but it doesn't have to be. All right, so,
Um, what I want to do right now, first of all, I'll take your questions. Then I'd like to put you in groups. And I want each of you again to try that there should be some leader and calls on each person individually to say something that struck them that they plan to write in their post about spiritual humanism. And then you can react to that person and help them write a better post. Does that make sense to everyone? Right, I think you can educate each other a lot better than I can educate you, right? Because you are creating this culture that I'm not gonna be a part of, you know? All I can do is plant the seeds and get you started. But you've got 50, 60 years, <laughs> long after I'm gone. And I do want you to just get started, basically. Okay, are there any questions? before we break into groups. Um, Professor, I do have a silly question. That is, I don't understand what we mean by the word culture when we use it. Like, what do we exactly mean by it? Good, what does the word culture mean? So philosophy is about those words that we usually use without thinking about it and thinking about them. Right? That's what philosophy is about. Well, um, I would say that there are animals who are very, um, create very sophisticated communities, right? So higher order primates, and a lot of people study them, um, apes, chimpanzees, they interact a lot. We can tell by the way the especially mothers treat their babies, that they have an emotional bond with them. Um, so it's not to denigrate other animals at all. It's just culture would be that human beings are self-consciously aware that they have choices about what to care about. And they create their group they create a culture based on some ideas about virtue and vice, good and evil, justice and injustice, uh, truth and falsity. So you can say that originally the grouping stars, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> started out just as ad adaptations to a natural environment. So Originally, they, the people or you know, creatures were not self-consciously aware, but then at a certain point, consciousness became conscious of itself. So at a certain point, they realized, oh, there really are patterns out there and we can understand them. So then they start creating language and then they start they start developing ideas that not only predict what's going to happen, but also they um, decide on a set of values, right? They decide what's of ultimate worth. So the one we're gonna study next time, I mean, Augustine after this, is just based on these ideas of the eternal versus the temporal. So the idea of eternal, the idea that you have a free will and your whole goal in life is to be saved right after you die, that's a culture, right? There's no way that an animal would decide, you know, that I better treat my babies well or I'm gonna go to hell or something like that. Right, the power of ideas is incredibly scary because it makes us both extremely good. We can actually starve ourselves for the sake of a cause, but it also can make us extremely evil, right? We can kill our own 
We can have mothers killing their kids. We can, there's just, it makes people crazy <laughs> because they have to, they start basing everything on ideas. Does that answer your question, Sabeka? Yeah. So, Professor, basically, so what I understand is that culture is a system of working based on a system of thinking, right? Right, that's right. And, and what's going to happen is that during the Enlightenment, they try to get rid of the mind. They try to just condition people to make them better. But then, recently, the neuroscientists that we're reading is saying, oh, as a matter of fact, ideas cause us to rewire our neural networks. Okay, so they couldn't understand this. Okay, so it was accepted, it was rejected, and now it's come back again. Um, so we're always reinventing the wheel because we overvalue science, right? Science is God, science is gonna save the world. Well, I mean, when we thought religion was God and religion is gonna save the world, that didn't work very well. And the scientists come in there, no, no, we're gonna save the world, right? And then we end up with a mess. So um, all, I'm, all I want my students to know is that the official intellectuals, the people who are honored, don't necessarily know any more than you do. I mean, okay, you, you can develop a very sophisticated opinion. You're completely capable of it. And people who get rewarded for one position tend to obsess about it and think they're wiser than they actually are. And they tend to forget alternatives or to oversimplify alternatives. So I do want you all to understand that you not only have a responsibility to do this for your own sake, so you develop a, a good robust set of ideas or commitments about thinking that you can live with, but you can, you know, you can develop opinions that are really, really excellent, right? They're not trivial or amateur um, because living well is something we all do. And the professionals, I'll tell you, um, when we had our economic collapse, people were saying, well, where are the economists? Where are the specialists? As a matter of fact, they are specialists in general are worse at predicting things than the average person. And that's because their egos get too big and they get too fixated on one thing. And so for you to listen to all these opinions, keep an open mind, synthesize a point of view, you need to give yourself credit. You could come up with something very sophisticated, okay? Um, all right, that's another reason I really enjoy teaching because I love reading this stuff. Students that say amazing things. Um, all right, so I got to stop the recording for a minute or pause it. Don't stop it, pause it. And uh, break, I'll put you in breakout rooms. Just... Okay, so I've resumed the recording. Um, so I do think um, I apologize for um, sending too many emails and not figuring stuff out. Um, but if you don't know what's going on, you should always email me because honestly, I am, you know, I don't shut people down if they email me. I really want everyone to get engaged by now, right? Um, okay. <laughs> I wasn't looking at names, you know, Pooja. <laughs> I can't even remember who was saying they were confused, but, um, I, I don't, yeah, I don't mind at all that you were confused. I mind, you know, I get annoyed with myself that I can't somehow seem to punch the right buttons, but, um, you need to be proactive, right? 
you need to make sure you can find another student or contact me because it's important to you psychologically to say, I want this education. Uh, Professor Beck gets paid to do this. Um, you don't have to get angry, right? You just have to be, you know, just be proactive and um, and not let not let it bother you. I mean, I there's no reason to you know feel confused or left behind, right? All you do is, yep, I gotta fix this. So if you decide there's something that needs fixing, fix it. I think you I think you have the agency to do that. Um, all right. So the next point of view. I, uh, all right, why don't we have, do we have a reporter, somebody reporting in from group one? Uh, anyone else wanna go from our group? Okay, if not, then we generally talked about uh, spiritual humanism and how it's important where if we fuse the scientific inquiry into human behavior and then the impact of religious rituals and methods on our life and how these dimensions of self-realization at the same time social services the community life and uh, these aspects uh, could give a meaningful yeah meaningfulness to our life so we generally discuss that okay good i do want to give you a sense the word spiritual is considered natural on this. That's why you never hear about it, right? Um, spiritual doesn't mean supernatural. It means natural, so that's important. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was gonna say about to Sabe Kun's question, uh, for example, the ideas about women, right? People might say that in order for the society to be to survive, even if women are just as capable as men intellectually and professionally, they should be conditioned not to become engaged at too high a level because then they won't take care of their kids and then they won't have kids and then the society will go down, right? Uh, so you can't you can't just say that we're we're based on survival. We're based on our ideas. Somebody else's ideas is no. Women should be able to cultivate all their capabilities and people will figure out how to get kids raised, right? They can do it jointly, they can do it right. But it's some ideas that drive the way the society gets structured and that becomes a culture. Does that make sense? Ideas about women. Of That's also one of my major questions, Professor. In the past couple of days, I've been wondering about what it means to be a man and a woman. Uh, woman, like what is masculine? What is feminine? I was reading an article the other day, and a feminist article, and was saying that men don't like feminine things, and. And I don't know what they mean by feminine things. I find very <laughs> right, very good. Yeah. Right, all of that is really culture, right? Socially constructed. I remember when somebody wrote an article about the social construction of the breast, right? <laughs> so, you know, in some societies like Africa, breasts are for feeding babies. They're not, you know, something women have to cover up. They don't, they're not intended to like get men sexually aroused. And so you have to cover them up, you know? So there's some things that are definitely, that is a socially, that's a cultural uh, appropriation or way of dealing with it. Um, there's a natural foundation, right? Women have breasts because they feed babies, but then culture does all this weird stuff with it. And we can, con we can decide though, what is the healthiest way? What is the way that allows 
as many people as possible to flourish at the highest level possible. And I think the sexualization of the breast is a way to prevent women. It makes women self-conscious. It sets them back, I think. Does that make sense to everyone? So just because you know, people are very malleable doesn't mean they're not accountable. You can go back to a natural foundation and you can evaluate and judge. Okay, so group number two, what you got? Um, you guys okay with me speaking? Group two? Sure, Professor. Sure. Sebego Mukans. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I got disconnected in the middle and I joined towards the end, so I don't have a lot of things gathered. Um, so I have two persons' point of views. Uh, the first is Isha. Um, so what she understands by spiritual humanism is that she focused on the spiritual part, the fact that humans are conditioned like any other animals to always look for peace of mind and tranquility and therefore like anything that helps them to survive. So, so to her, the spiritual thing is, is, I mean, from what I understand is this drive to survive and therefore it's a mix of pleasure and fear, whatever but the combination of pleasure and fear that helps, that gives them a better chance to survive. They, they do things accordingly. And the second person is Masuma. She focused on the, the humanism part. To her, um, it, it's more with the mind, uh, rationality to her. What it means to be human is to make the right decision at the right time in the right place. So to her, what makes us very different from other animals, what really sets us apart is the fact that we, like you mentioned previously, our consciousness at some point became aware of the consciousness and therefore we became more rational. We understand what's right, but it may not play out in the way that we are acting upon what we think is right. But the fact that we are even being able to think about what's right and wrong is what's it's is the meaning of human being so yeah that's that's all that i was able to gather and the rest of us was not able to speak because we ran out of time i'm sorry guys Professor, uh, yeah so begun I, I just want to make a correction here so uh yeah i was talking about the humanism uh the word humanism so i defined it according to aristotle so Oh, it wasn't my idea that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's what she understands. Yeah, but I say that I'm. I co I found it quite interesting. I also I think that we can follow this as well. So, uh, I'm in between and I'm thinking about this still. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, How professor, from an interesting thing that. Oh, man, what is happening? <laughs> Okay, I, th I think we'll go to group three. Somebody have um, a... I maybe group three, I split up into bits. What about group four? Anybody remember what group they're in? Uh, yes, Professor. Okay. So, uh, first we uh, started discussing about what spiritual humanism is. Uh, and uh, we tried to, first of all, we had a discussion about whether uh, the spiritual in spiritual humanism has anything to do with religion. So at first, a few of us agreed that uh, maybe it does have something to do with religion. But then I mentioned that uh, I, like I, my point of view was uh, different from what Ashley and Chuck said. I said that uh, what I feel like is that um, when we are, when our, like basically our spirits are thriving to its full potential and we are using it for the, we're using it uh, to contribute to the society, I would think that is spiritual humanism. And I, I don't really think that it 
really had something to do with religion. <clears throat> and then uh, we discussed about oh, what we wrote in the uh, what we wrote in the post or we plan to write about in the post. So one point that Ashley mentioned was that um, even if we uh, write a letter to our friend about, uh, suggesting about some problem, so or she addressed uh, 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 what was it, Ashley? I forgot the word rational ambition, right? So she wanted to write about rational ambition. And she mentioned that uh, just like uh, when Seneca advises Serena, um, it is uh, like he is suggesting a way of life according to Aristotle, but uh, we also think culture has an influence, right? So let's say if I am giving Ashlyn advice on how to have a healthier psych, my advice to her has to be uh, culturally appropriate as well. I cannot expect her to shift her entire life paradigm and live her life according to Aristotle. So we think that that will be also quite impossible. So uh, yeah, I think we discussed a lot about culture. So if anyone wants to add it? Okay, group five. Um, Oops. Uh, okay, so we're from, I'm from group five. I'll speak uh, on behalf of them. Um, we talked about uh, first spiritual humanism and how we define it. Uh, well, actually, we could not separate the, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that religion is actually a part of, <laughs> it was a part of our discussion because uh, people like they the the way like uh, the interaction between people and nature and others uh it, it's based on the you know the belief system and how it's taught through, like from generation to generation so there was an example of uh the end of the word by diana and she said that in her uh culture like there is so much dependence on religious beliefs. So uh, people, there's like a lot less uh, thinking about science and reasoning like by science. Uh, also, there was an example of COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, so, uh, there is, you know, uh, like the, the uh, ability of human like to solve the societal problems such as like uh, COVID vaccination uh, is also like is like uh, uh, they they don't depend on science even that even even though like COVID vaccination is most uh, based of, of uh, based on science. So like, for example, they don't take vaccination because there's a belief that God will save us and uh, it, it doesn't make, make sense, you know? Um, and that's what we covered actually. Uh, yeah, I, think, I, I do want you to sort through this idea of what is the relationship between science and religion, right? And so what we're going to do now with Augustine and Aquinas is to show you that the major characters in Christianity, and I, I think this is true in, in other religions, they were intellectuals and they united reason and faith in, in a certain way. Also, um, liberal arts education is, its origin was all related to uniting reason with faith. So the people who originally developed liberal arts education, they were people of faith, but they wanted it to be tied to science and religion. So that when you read in the newspaper about people rejecting the vaccines because of their religion, that is just the dominant view. And so I, I really think I have an obligation to let you know that that is not the tradition 
and that your efforts to figure out on your own how you think they are related are legitimate efforts and they put you much more in the tradition of people who have been honored in the past. Um, does that make sense to the rest of you? I mean, I do think that that is a very important function for a teacher in a liberal arts because what happens is that you get, you know, all of you are ambitious and I think you're great, but you know that some Muslims or people in your religious tradition don't think women should go to college and they don't think, you know, this is a good thing. So you've obviously been able to critically reflect on your tradition, right? And all I'm telling you is that you don't have to throw it all out and come and go, science is gonna save us. Um, you, but, you know, so just popular views of these issues of women, of religion, of science and of the relation, popularized views are not fair and they're not true to the tradition. So, so that's what I, I do want to get across. And so when we talk about Augustine now, he's going to give you another view of religion. And what I want you to do, if you're Muslim or if you're something else, it doesn't matter, but there are three traditions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity that presuppose this single God they're monogamous, and with especially Islam and Christianity, there's a final judgment day, right? So the whole point is to end up in heaven and not in hell. <laughs> now, if you're Hindu or Buddhist or humanist or whatever, you might say, this is ridiculous, like throw the whole thing out, right? But um, I'm just gonna help you sort through the ideas, the questions. I think Augustine gives you a set of ideas and questions that are, might be a lot more applicable to Islam than you may think. And then I'm not sure, but I will find out. Uh, but even those of you who never, who couldn't care less, I mean, it's not your opinion you should understand why it's compelling and why people keep believing this stuff. Because there are trains of reasoning that make sense of it, right? Um, so first of all, I had you read that newspaper article about raising children, because I do want you to realize that the way kids are raised really is driven by the ideas of their parents. And I don't know to what extent all of you are aware of that. You've talked to your parents about that. But the other side of it is parents really disagree. <laughs> and so with humanism, with ancient humanism, for example, the temporal world is filled with creatures trying to achieve their ultimate level of flourishing. So the natural world is good, right? And it's beautiful and it's true and it's wonderful. And so sexuality, for example, nothing wrong with sexuality. It's part of flourishing, right? So a flourishing life would include uh, sexual behavior. And so a Greek would say, yeah, sexual pleasure is intensely pleasant. It's very pleasant because we wouldn't survive unless it were pleasant, right? People have to go to all sorts of extremes to satisfy themselves sexually in order for the species to get to survive from one generation to the next. So there's nothing wrong with, with the fact that it's pleasurable. The trouble is, that children need adults to condition them, to habituate them for 15 years. And so societies, human beings flourish a lot better when they 
demand monogamy, right? That two people get together, they have children, they stay together, they raise the kids together, they provide emotional stability, they provide psychological stability, right? Uh, economic stability, that's the goal. And society should, should be structured to encourage that. Now, on the other hand, there's a lot of people who are messed up. <laughs> and so it doesn't always work out. And so you can argue that sometimes keeping people together is more psychologically crippling to a child than divorce, right? If the parents are constantly arguing, whereas if a kid in divorce, the one parent would be, would encourage flourishing and, and that, and people do deliberate like this. They actually deliberate about this, right? Which thing would provide the most flourishing for a child? So in general, monogamy would be encouraged, but in particular cases, no. Um, all right, but what does Augustine do? Augustine condemns the temporal world, all right? There's the temporal versus the eternal. And uh, lust, you know, the desire for sexual gratification is a sin, all right? It's temporal. It's temporal pleasure. And we should get over it. So Augustine, Augustine's model is structured on guilt, right? Guilt for being a physical being. There's, that's an inferior thing. And so this is, this is much more of a split between the eternal and the temporal. And he denigrates the temporal. And the goal is to keep focused on the eternal, you know, as much as possible. So this is what I want you, that's what that woman talked about, the way she was raised is she was raised on guilt. Uh, I hope you read it. You should have read it. It wasn't very long. I didn't assign very much. Um, I would like you in your posts to tell me how much time you spent, right? And then also um, if you attended class and if you didn't attend class, why not? Because I try to take attendance, but it's imprecise. And my job isn't to chase you down. So, I mean, you could just say in your post, I didn't come and it's unexcused and that's fine. You can just mark me as an unexcused absence. You know, one thing I wanted in college was to get treated like an adult. So I'm not gonna chase you down, just be honest, all right? intellectual honesty, I'll, I'll make you feel guilty. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, that's all, that's basically my policy about these things. I try to take attendance imprecisely just so when it gets down to just a few names that aren't there that will start. So I will try to do that, but I'm not gonna depend on my list. And you can just tell me and be totally honest. All right, let's get to Augustine. This is what it means to have a guilt culture. And the United States is an interesting case in point. Uh, again, I'm, you know, on the one hand, you have your own countries, why should the US matter? And I don't want you to think the US should matter, but I think that all these cultural wars that go on in the US are probably also, there's probably analogies to your countries or your village or your family. So that's why I'm presenting it, is that I think in this, in this overall quest to develop some sort of international culture because we do have to do this. 
to deal with climate change issues, to deal with economic, international economic systems. I mean, we're all connected together. So we do have to develop some sort of idea of how we need to relate to each other. And these are the, the touch points that are dividing people quite a bit within countries and between countries. So first of all, here's this, um, I guess I'm not gonna just sit and ask, what did you think of it? I'll, when you're in your groups, you should, you know, say what you thought of this, but this is just an example of how in a, the US, which is supposed to be this very sophisticated science type of country has a huge percentage of Americans have a very, very anti-science kind of religious point of view. And there's a huge percentage of Americans who grow up with a lot of guilt and the fear of sin. So we go back to Aristotle's basic drives, right? Pleasure and fear. And so this way of looking at things really exploits both of them, right? It tells you, you know, that sexual pleasure is evil and it, and it, it just feeds the fear of sin, the fear of eternal damnation. So it's appealing to pleasure and fear, and it's doing it in a way that, that denigrates this world. So this is the opposite of spiritual humanism, of what Aristotle said, right? Aristotle is human flourishing, human happiness, setting up societies where people can be fully human, which is societies where people are self-controlled, because they want to be, they've internalized it. But as opposed to this view, that's very anti-humanist, right? It's supernatural, it's eternal life as opposed to the temporal life. So these are two extremes and they are affecting political life within a society and between societies. All right. Um, and this woman, because she grew up with one extreme of religion, she raised her kids completely secular, right? We don't talk about God, we don't know. Totally the other extreme. And she focuses on social justice. And so the idea is that in, in the religion she grew up with, you, you don't focus on trying to fix problems. You just pray to God, right? And if COVID happens, it's God's will. And if I die of COVID, it's God's will. And if the environment pollution and all that happens, it's God's will. And you don't use reason at all to try to solve problems. And so this woman got totally turned off by that. And she teaches her daughters to march in, you know, anti-racist marches and pro-environment marches. And, and you, sh you know, I think you're aware that those marches for environmental stuff and um, Black Lives Matter and women's issues, there's plenty of secular humanists in those marches. The question is, are there also Christians in those marches? And I grew up, my dad marched, was a minister and he marched with Martin Luther King, right? So social justice and religion were just inseparable to me, but that is not my students at Lyon and that is not this woman. So that's something for you to work out. And this one is, when religion leads to trauma, literally, religion is crippling. So all of you are working on your idea of what a healthy psyche is. So is a healthy psyche one that is religious or not? Does it, do you have to make qualifications? So, you know, it seems to me you could 
have a psyche dedicated to honoring God without necessarily being this extreme. But that's up to you. Each of you should come up with your own conclusion. Anyway, so that's one thing. Uh, right now, there's a lot of using religion as a weapon, right? To um, demonize the humanists who are going to hell or to demonize within a country the, you know, Muslims and um, Hindus or something. They use religion to as a weapon, which is a terrible abuse of religion, I think. But again, it's common and it's possible if you focus on the doctrine, right? If you focus on the words in the book where the Muslims think that Muhammad was the seal of the prophets and Jesus was not the Messiah and the Christians think Jesus was the Messiah. And so we're gonna kill each other and we're gonna hate each other because of some words in a book, right? Whereas uh, Muslim humanists or Christian humanists, well, wait a sec, let's go back to those virtues. Let's go back to this way of life. And I don't care what, if you're religion or secular, I want, I want the virtues. That's what's the substance of the religions. In this woman's case, that was not the substance of the religion that she grew up with. She threw it all out and she ended up with virtue, right? So that's the first, first point. The second point is how do you think of your life? And so Augustine's Confessions has, um, okay, he, he tells a story of when he thinks God intervened in his life. So again, again I... Um, these are open questions. Each of you has your own position at this point in your life. Some of you think, <laughs> this has nothing to do with me. Some of you might be secular, some might be Hindu, some Buddhist. And Hindu and Buddhist don't have a personal God intervening in history like this, or Confucian or whatever. And then others of you might think this is the way you think, right? That you think God does intervene in history or intervenes in somebody's life. Uh, I do not know. I know that when I teach this at Lyon College, what, uh, four fifths of the students at least are raised with this. So it is influential. Um, so he's looking back and he's explaining his childhood and he had a conversion experience. Um, he talks about, I was a sickly child. I had natural curiosity. My parents beat me. I, mis I was mistreated by people. And, and so he's putting together, he's making sense of his experience that somehow that all had a purpose. I suffered unjustly, right? but it had this ultimate purpose that I finally found God, right? Um, so I went to college, right? College is often a watershed where students are put, thrown in with people from a lot of different beliefs. Now in um, Augustine's case, the atmosphere was very corrupt. The students were, you know, engaged in all sorts of sex and drinking and sloth and the teachers were hypocrites and they taught Greek mythology in a way that promoted all sorts of promiscuity and the education glorified corruption. We were taught how to manipulate people to get what we wanted. So I myself had a sexual affair um, and so Okay, he said, in spite of all this, I did have this natural curiosity. I, you know, I did naturally have natural reason. Um, okay, then his next thing, he was trying to find something to live for. And he went from, he read Cicero, 
He went from one thing to the next. Um, wandering in the wilderness, he went to astrology. Uh, he went to Manichaeanism. So again, you don't have to know all these things, just the, in general, this quest, this quest to find out what your ultimate purpose is in life. Or in his case, it's you're wandering in, in the temporal world, the evil world, and you have to get you know, converted to the eternal world, to God. You have a religious conversion. Um, he met a bishop who told him that you can unite reason and faith. So this is, this is again, why I emphasize this, is that in Augustine's view, he's uniting reason and faith. It's not an anti-intellectual kind of religion. So he was told that, and then he had this experience. Um, and he set up, right, his own idea of how reason and faith are united. Um, and I'll talk about this. Oh, okay. So I'll talk about this in the next, here we go. This is his view of reality. All right. So his view of the human condition, and it's cut off on the left hand, is that we are the creature of free will. The most important tool we have is our free will. And we use that to either turn toward the eternal and get saved and have eternal life in heaven, or we turn toward the temporal and get damned and have eternal life in hell, okay? So for Aristotle, our most important power is our power of the mind, our idea of the good that drives everything we do and the development of all our capabilities and wisdom. For this, wisdom is of this world, right? That's the excellence of the secularists, of the humanists, right? The people that Augustine went to college with and under. He rejects that. He says, nope, our most important capacity is our free will. All right. How do we know we have free will? How do we know how we're supposed to use it? And he gives an argument based on reason here. First of all, he says, you look at the natural world, all right? So you look at a squirrel, for example. <laughs> Somewhere I have a, uh, one of my students gave me this little stuffed squirrel <laughs> because I talked about squirrels so much. And I really would like to find it. But again, I just moved. And you can imagine, you know, I just threw it somewhere. There's no way I'm going to find it. But OK, so you know, you can go look outside of your window. Everybody, nature is there. The natural world is there. Now, we know there's an order to it, OK? Now, Aristotle was like an environmentalist. He thought of the biosphere. That's not what Augustine looks at. So the, the, the thing, the reason I like these systems is that they're very systematic. These guys knew how to think systematically. So I just want to indulge you. You just have to get wrapped around this. You can figure this out. You might want to resist it because you don't agree with it, but don't do that. Just give yourself a break. Blow your mind. Give yourself a chance. All right. So you look outside your window, you see the trees and the animals and all those things that we all see. And you know there's an order. And then human beings measure that order through the use of number. That's what he's focusing on. If we want to understand a squirrel, you know, we measure their height, their weight, their um, you know, we, we use numbers to figure out that underlying order in the universe. Now, this is like physicists, right? They find a, you know, a mathematical formula to explain the motions of the planets or, 
you know, there's lots of scientists that basically use models that are abstract and mathematical, okay? So, and then you reflect on that number, right? Well, number is eternal and immutable. Two plus two is four forever. So number has a different nature than biology, right? Number doesn't change. And so if the, if the way that we understand the order of the universe is through number, and number is eternal and immutable, then it's reasonable to believe that there's an eternal and immutable creator behind all of this stuff because everything in the, in the world, the natural world has an eternal ordered aspect and then a temporal aspect. And that it's our ability because we have that ability to understand it. We have this intellectual faculty of understanding numbers that are eternal and immutable, that we would be the creature that also can believe in God and give glory to God as the source of all of this, of the universe, okay? So that's step one that leads us, reason leads us to faith is what he's saying. Um, okay, if we look just at the temporal world, um, that things do not create material uh, components. Matter does not move itself or create itself, right? There has to be something else that originally set things in motion and that orders things, okay? And I'll talk more about that next time with St. Thomas Aquinas. But for now, that studying the natural world would lead you to belief in God. The next thing is that we have an innate idea. God planted ideas of good and evil in, uh, in our minds, right? That we use as a tool by which to judge ourselves and each other. How do we do that? Why do we know that? How do we know that? Well, we do judge people according to these ideas of good and evil, right? Um, let's see. So the temporal world is itself good, but it becomes evil if people choose it, right? In other words, uh, we can't say animals are evil, they're not, but our choices, we have to always choose to turn toward the eternal rather than the temporal. So whenever we choose to get distracted by the temporal things, that makes them evil, but it's our choices that are evil, right? The temporal world itself is neutral, but turning toward it, valuing it, acting on the basis of it. That's evil. Um, all right. Then we also, when we're looking at our minds, we judge other people's minds, right? We say, well, that person, you know, in your whole history, right? When you were eight years old, you didn't know things that you knew when you were 10 years old. And then every year you get to understand more things and, you know, on and on. So we judge our own minds as incomplete, as uh, more or less ignorant. So our minds don't create reality, uh, but we recognize truth. Like we can know that seven plus three is 10. We can just recognize that. So on the one hand, we recognize that there are these eternal truths. And we also recognize that our minds are limited. And so we, we should believe that there's something higher than our minds, 
Our minds don't create reality. There's something higher than our minds. And that is what God is, right? God is the mind higher than our minds, right? Our minds are, we're wise enough or rational enough to know there is such a thing as a mind, but we also know the human mind is limited. So therefore it's reasonable to think there that God is mind, right? and is greater than we are, okay? Then the third thing, we have innate ideas of justice and injustice. And we have these ideas that good societies deserve to govern themselves and wicked societies deserve to have wicked leaders, right? Good people deserve to be happy evil people deserve to be unhappy. That isn't necessarily what we physically observe, right? I mean, if you took a little Gallup poll or if you took a little poll of, you know, people in the world, there's plenty of good people that are suffering at the hands of bad leaders and plenty of bad people that get away with good leaders. I mean, this is not a description. This is an idea, right? And so Augustine is saying, where did these ideas come from? They came from God, right? They're innate. So God gave us these ideas about eternal truths. And um, they're, not, they're not natural, but they're the tool through which we evaluate what's in front of us. And that's how we know how we should live. So we're given the ideas about how to govern our free will. So God gave us free will, but also gave us the guidebook. Like it's no fair. <laughs> God gives you free will, but I'm not going to tell you how to use it. Ha <laughs> ha. And when you abuse it, you're going to hell. No, that's not fair. <laughs> so God gave us free will and gave us reason so that we know how to use it. And then we're accountable, okay? So, so this is, we have innate ideas of good and evil, and we know that we cho should choose the eternal over the temporal, okay? Now, in the natural world, all right, the material, material temporal world never overpowers the eternal. And so the, we know with our reason that the eternal is more powerful than the temporal. And we also know that our reason is capable of grasping the eternal. So our reason by nature should govern our behavior, right? So our reason should always govern our temporal nature. But it doesn't. We know that. <laughs> well, how come? Well, because we have free will. And so Augustine is actually giving an argument for free will. I hope that makes sense to you if you really wrap your head around it. Um, the eternal is more powerful than the temporal. Our minds are capable of knowing that. So our minds by nature should always be more powerful than our bodies, but they're not. So we must have this power of free will that chooses whether to follow what our minds tell us based on eternal truths or to follow what our bodies tell us which is, hey, go for the sex and the food and the drink, okay? Um, so that's how he argues based on the union of reason and faith, on his view of reason, he argues for free will, he argues that it's rational to believe there is a God that's eternal, that's a mind that's higher than our, our mind, and that orders and ordains that we should order human society in a way that, that 
good people, people who choose the eternal, deserve to have leaders that choose the eternal, and people who choose the temporal deserve to have bad leaders. Those are ideas in our head that should never go away in spite of our experience, but they should inform our experience and they should enable us to judge uh, as better and worse everything that goes on in the world. Um, so you are not required to read this. If you want to read that, that's fine, but I won't require you to do that. Here is an outline just once again, repeating what I've said, but the outline is sort of like the cheat sheet if you wanna look it over. Um, so you exist, you're alive, you understand. So in philosophy, we always talk about reason, what it means to be rational. It's just that philosophers have profoundly disagreed about what reason is and what it means to be rational and our place in the universe. So in Augustine's view, the natural object of reason is the eternal. And the way that we figure that out is through mathematics. Um, okay, let's see. We know reason, reason we, okay, we use our reason, our knowledge of the eternal, to judge ourselves, right? In terms of our sensuous desires, um, we can we judge ourselves. We're, we constantly tell ourselves to go for the eternal or the temporal. Um, okay. Let's see, math knows eternal truths, blah, blah. So I've already said, said that, that mathematics is sort of the ticket toward understanding our reason. We have innate rules. Every, um, everyone wants to be happy. Wisdom is the truth in which the highest good is discerned. Um, there are universal rules of truth. We ought to live justly. The inferior is subject to the superior. Everyone should be given his due. The uncorrupted is better. The eternal is better applying those rules to action. Uh, we make judgments all the time. So reason leads us to belief in God and to belief in our free will and to belief that we need to use our free will to choose the eternal and that we will be judged on the basis of what we do with our free will. Okay, and so I sort of summarize those here. Now, if you were raised Muslim, you could compare this to what you learned as a Muslim and just see if they're similar or different. Um, I hope that makes sense because I mean, you think belief in the eternal. Islam, I know the intellectual tradition of Islam, a lot of it was very mathematics oriented. Um, but again, I'm, that's just a general, very general statement. So each of you has very different experiences, I'm sure. But I hope you understand that this argument is very generic. Um, it could apply to, to a lot of different religions, but also then it's interesting to compare it with modern science, right? This is what modern science completely rejects. But I want you to at least think about it before rejecting it. And I do want you to think about whether your particular version of religion or Islam, um, if you were raised with that, is connected to some sort of argument like this, okay? Um, all right. Then the next thing is, the next point is ethics. Um, let's see, oh, the problem of evil, right? How do you deal with, how do you deal with the question? If you think God is perfect and all powerful and created the universe and everything in it, why is there evil, right? So again, I would love to have students answer this, but of course we can't. 
Um, you can do it in small groups. You can, uh, you, you know, you can come in office hours and talk to me about it. But I think it's a natural question to ask, right? If God is perfect and all powerful, why is there evil? On the one hand, if a world that has evil, either God isn't perfect and created evil, or God isn't all powerful and a force of evil entered in because God isn't all powerful. So Augustine is wrestling with that question, all right? First of all, he says that a universe with a creature with free will in it is better than a universe without a creature with free will. So for example, a horse. A horse uh, does what comes natural to a horse and a monkey. All these other cre creatures just naturally do what's natural for them to flourish. Human beings are really messed up. <laughs> they do all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, well, why? Because they have free will. But a universe that has a creature with free will also has virtue in it because virtue is choosing, self-consciously, freely choosing to be good. And that's better than a monkey or a horse that is good, but just because, but without choosing it. So to choose to be good is a higher level of being. It's a very good thing. So a universe with a creature with free will is better because it has virtue in it. It also has justice in it. When people with free will choose to rule for the benefit of the ruled, that's a better universe. And a universe with a creature that can understand the universe and appreciate it and understand that it's ordered by God and worship the God that ordered it is better than a universe without a creature with free will. But <laughs> the universe without the creature with free will doesn't have evil. <laughs> the universe with the creature with free will is the one that has evil, right? So question is, did God create evil? Ah, no. The answer is no, of course. God created free will. Free will means that you have the option of choosing evil. God gave you reason to tell you how to use it. So, but you had a choice. So evil is the turning of the will away from the eternal toward the temporal. That's the definition of evil. God did not create evil, okay? God created free will. But, and, Professor? Yeah? So, but that, I mean, according to Augustine, God is all-powerful and all-knowing, so God knows the outcome of granting human beings free will. Great. So God knows that through free will, they will commit evil. So knowing that there will be evil through granting this power, isn't God creating evil? In a sense? Ah, very good question. Right, and he, he, and he has an answer to it, but that's a good question, of course. Well, the trouble is, if he, it, okay, so if he foreknows that it's going to get abused, right? When God created free will, God knew ahead of time that it would be abused. Well, God has two choices, to refuse to create it or to create it knowing people will abuse it, right? Does that make sense? And so what Augustine is saying is that 
it's a better choice to create it anyway, because the universe is better that way, because it has virtue and it has justice. And then, as long as God gave you reason, the guidebook, then God punishes and rewards after death. And so a universe that has this creature that chooses virtue or vice, chooses justice or injustice, and is ultimately rewarded or punished, is a better universe than one where God refused <laughs> to create the creature with free will. It's, it's better to have a more complete universe with higher levels of good. And then, to and then yeah, go ahead. Professor, then, then there's a better option of not creating any universe at all, right? Because then there's no option of evil. So I mean, why even create a universe that good. commits to evil? Okay, that's good. Really good question. And so Augustine's idea is that being is good, right? Reality is good. <laughs> Uh, it's better to have reality than to have nothing. And so to create every possible reality is better than not to create anything. That, that's his answer. The assumption that being is good, better than non-being, right? I mean, if people want to have children, for example, I mean, they know that those kids are gonna doubt them at some point, right? The average two-year-old and then 12-year-olds. And then, you know, it's very unlikely that this kid is going to worship them and never question them. And, you know, kids aren't like that. Human beings aren't like that. But does that mean they refuse to have children? Just because, so, right. So, Professor, um, um, I mean, his reasoning that it's better to have a reality than not, isn't this from a human perspective, the fact that it's better to even exist and have experiences than not exist at all? So I think from my perspective, his judging this either to exist or not to exist from a human perspective because it brings something to us. But to God, I don't, I don't know what, what it brings to him or he can, I mean, I feel like <clears throat> the idea of good and bad and evil and it's all constructed. Okay. I mean, even the sense of time yeah. being similar to that, it's constructed and therefore we see and understand everything according to these constructions and ideas that we have but to god he's seeing it from i mean yeah that's that's what i understand he's seeing it from an outside perspective and he knows that these are ideas but it may be <clears throat> that this idea of idea doesn't even exist in the objective reality i don't know if i'm making sense well but like well. Right. No, I think the thing is, I do think that all of you need to understand that we naturally ask these kinds of questions, right? They're natural um, because we are capable of thinking. And so we do have questions about our thinking. What does our thinking tell us about anything? But in Augustine's case, he would say that our capacity for math is this tiny little light bulb that connects us to the eternal. And, and so if God is eternal, why wouldn't God want to create as much as possible that's ordered according to eternal order? Why wouldn't God to just want to manifest everything, right? That makes more sense to me than just sit there and be God, <laughs> right? Does that make sense to you? Professor, even uh, that. Professor? Like, this, yeah, go ahead. 
I, I'd like, I just wanted to add that if that was God's purpose, um, just, uh, just instead of just sitting there um, creating something, creating free will and creating existence. So isn't that um, kind of human of God exactly. to be thinking that, that way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like this idea of loneliness and isolation is, is a human experience how do we know that god feels these human experiences too or is it the other way around that um god has created humans with the idea that um they would feel um similar feelings or experiences that god himself feels uh, i mean well, actually, does that make sense well, actually, feelings, you should leave feelings out of it, because that's what ties us to the temporal, right? It's, it's uh -huh. our capacity for math, which is detached from our bodies. That's our link to God. So be careful, keep feelings out of it, because this is a completely intellectual view of God, right? It's based on our intellect. And we're supposed to drive our lives through our intellects, right? our ideas we're not supposed to pay attention to those nasty feelings because but they professor even our intellect is limited right even our intellectual perspective of god would be limited because again that's human a human right. characteristic right it's just that our reason leads us to believe in god right uh -huh. and god is beyond our ability to understand but it's more reasonable to think that there is an eternal being that created and ordered what we see. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. So you wanna say that um, <clears throat> if we keep reason as the standard to reach God or understand God, that's more better you want to say? Because if you remove feelings, we are then it's like either we should set a uh, feelings as the standard to understand God or we should set standard uh, reason as the standard and then well, actually yeah the word reason is ambiguous right yeah again so for, yeah so for Aristotle reason means human flourishing in this world right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for Augustine reason means math and detachment from this world and focusing on the eternal. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it's quite, I guess. Um, it... <laughs> Professor, I think what we're trying to say is this detachment is not detached at the end of the day. It, yeah, yes. This, this, as Mewish was pointing out, this, pers this intellectual perspective that God, I mean, it's better choice for God to create than not to create is also influenced by human choices and what we feel about our experiences of isolation and loneliness. So the feeling aspect is getting tied to Augustine's understanding of what choices God would make. And so it's not very intellectual at the end of the day. It's, 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 it's infused with human experiences. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is that he's trying to argue for a non- anthropological right yeah, for a know, yeah. of god that is not a projection of human beings right yeah, he's exactly. trying to do that yeah so our question is is that possible yeah. is that possible to de-teach yourself and then even then contemplate is that possible being a human being right is it possible and is it even valuable right uh -huh. that's the next thing is that, I mean, something like Aristotle would say, it's not even valuable to, eat, to try to separate yourself from your emotions. What's valuable is to educate your emotions, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, but that's where you get that woman who was raised with this view, right? Ever since she's little, the kid is supposed to not have emotions, right? And supposed to focus on God. And that's why she felt she, she was just raised with all this guilt, right? So does that make sense that it ties together? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so 
Okay, so um, free will is a good thing. And it's just like somebody is born blind. Does that mean eyes and vision are evil just because someone was born with a defective sight? No, you know, sight is a good thing. It's just that it can fail to develop. So with choosing evil that's just a failure to use free will in the way it was intended to be used um and so he argues for why and the nature of evil is the turning of the will from the eternal to the temporal and god did not create that that's not god's fault okay does everybody understand that can you repeat it professor Evil is defined as the turning of the will from the eternal toward the temporal. We can know with our reason we're not supposed to do that. God did not create that turning of the will. Then how would we go on and claim that God is the ultimate creator? Well, if God created um let's see so, professor what do we mean by turning up the wheel in this right context? choosing Even. choosing the temporal right so you take your free will and you choose lust sloth greed gluttony pride right that's that's what i mean is the way you choose it right God didn't create your choices. God created your free will to make choices. So that actually it, it becomes confusing because then it's at a point we are the creator because our free will will lead us to choices and create events, right? So then we became the creator. You are a creator. It's just that he thinks you can be judged by uh -huh right and 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 how would you how would you justify the judgment like will it be based on some religious aspect of for example christianity and islam that it's after death or then yeah then again that's subjective as well well that's what i mean that can be your opinion right that this is completely socially constructed right yeah and so i again but i just want every student to get a chance to sort through this. <laughs> Some of them, I mean, many people have been convinced of arguments like this. There's a math teacher in my school who basically thinks like this. And, and you know, if you study math and you like that realm of abstractions, and then you, you know, you follow through and say, you should act on the basis of abstractions, right? These beliefs, and you can have the strength of will to do that. And that's how you get saved. It would be intuitively obvious to them that you're supposed to choose um, eternal truth, which would be, you know, monogamy, and uh, all those all those good virtues but in the name of choosing the eternal and getting rewarded and so you have to resist your your natural self right your biological self has to be thwarted <laughs> you know repressed in order to focus on your eternal self and then the next thing is God's foreknowledge. God knew that we were going to sin, but didn't refuse to create free will. And here's another conundrum, guys. I want to ask you, if God foreknows that I'm going to sin, how come I'm the cause, right? Didn't God? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's right. confusing. I, Augustine has an answer to that, guys. Okay. Again, I do want you to understand these are natural questions human beings have asked. Okay. 
Here's the answer. Okay, so there's two human beings actually foreknow the future in certain respects. So I know if I'm alive five years from now, I'm going to be older, unfortunately, right? <laughs> I, okay, I can foreknow that I'm going to be older tomorrow than I was today, right? So there's certain things that occur by necessity. So human aging occurs by necessity. So even human beings can foreknow the things that occur by necessity, okay? But, but free will, the choices we make are not by necessity. They occur by choice. So how is humanity going to choose how to deal with climate change, right? We don't know. I mean, we know what we'd like them to do, but anyway. So, but, well, professor, yeah. Uh, even this um, idea of free will, I, I don't know about the, the scientific term used to, um, so basically there's this scientific theory that says that it's predictable as to what choices a person will make based on the other choices that they have made due to certain experiences. So for instance, if there's a person that grows up in a family where the father is a drunk car, then it becomes more likely for, the, for this growing child to also become a drunk car in the future. So the probability of this person to make the choice to become uh, a drunk or, I mean, um, uh, uh, an alcohol addict is due to his or her experience, past experiences. So this free will. Well, actually, I mean, but the reason we, we talk about probabilities, that's when therapists come in and try to get people to think differently. So they don't fall into that, right? It's never by necessity. It's more likely, but it's not by necessity. And actually, we're gonna we're gonna talk about determinism in the future, right? And that determinism is a reaction against this this kind of point of view, because this kind of point of view is very anti-biological, right? It's anti-contextual. It's anti-historical. It just tells you, you have reason, you can choose the eternal, you're responsible, right? For, and you will get judged. So that, and that's, we will get to that. It's a reaction, the modern world reacted against that. Science reacted against this. The point I'm making here is that it is still, there's a certain reason, you know, capacity of reasoning, mathematics, that can lead us here and there are people who still think like this. Um, and okay, so the, the question of if God knows I'm gonna sin tomorrow, didn't God cause it, okay? The answer to that is there are certain things that occur by necessity. I will be older tomorrow. There's some things that occur by choice. That is the realm of human culture, but we, and so we have to, even we can predict necessity, but God also foreknows culture. Now that is an object of faith. Our reason cannot comprehend that God could understand, could foreknow events that occur by choice. That makes no sense to us. That's why you have to just believe it because you can't understand it. But of course, God is beyond human understanding. So that has to be an object of faith. Okay, then God's intervention in history. So how does Augustine deal? Professor, ju just a, a question here yeah. out of curiosity. Like, how do we reach this conclusion that uh, since our reasoning cannot understand it, so that's why we just have to believe it, that God right. is beyond our understanding. Firstly, we are keeping the standard that let's let's use our reasoning or some kind of myths to understand God. 
And then out of nowhere, we are like, oh, we cannot understand God. God is beyond understanding. So right. they themselves are contradictory. So. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you, can, you can think that. That's fine. But the idea, Augustine's idea is that we can understand that the natural world has an eternal part to it. It's ordered. Mm -hmm. and so there must be a cause, an eternal cause that, that ordered it. And okay. so we don't understand that cause. We just have to draw this inference that it must be there. And then we have to draw the inference that God must be able to foreknow what we choose, right? And so those are all things that we can't know, but that we, he thinks it's more reasonable to believe that. So it is a matter of belief, but it's reasonable to believe. So that's where, he, how he unites reason and faith. Okay. 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 Yeah, I got it. Okay. I mean, I'll tell you, it's, I think it's fun to teach it because I just have to think, God, this guy, you know, <laughs> like he was systematic I like systematic thinking but I mean I obviously I'm more of an Aristotelian I'm not into this stuff but I do appreciate it and I do want you all to know that everything I teach I kind of in in awe about it because the people were brilliant and they came up with these amazing world views so I hope that every I used to dress up like these people and just tell them this is the way it is. And so I do want every every class day, you know, to try and convince you, you know, that this is really amazing stuff and it's perfectly believable. And it it has had an incredible impact on human history. And um, whether or not it still does is really up to human beings to decide. But that's that's my main point. So, um, professor, yeah. So, professor, I'm also like curious. So, if Augustine is arguing that uh, God created this internal uh, or uh, external world, uh, I mean, this temporary world or the human being, and then uh, it's not the God's, uh, you know, fault or that they cre he created the evils because we have the free will to choose. Uh, then uh, my question is that whether God know the probability that uh, maybe human uh, beings might choose temporal world, not yeah, the external world, right. because this is some kind nat natural. So we have this desire for food. I'm created in this way uh, uh, I, to desire to eat or maybe other desires, natural desires that we scientific uh, uh, prove that this we, we have this one and this is something natural. So my question is that uh, if if God know these things and and know that there is this probability, then who is fault is here? So. Yeah, right. Okay, that's a good question, right? But for Augustine, you eat as much as you need to eat, you know, to stay alive. But you don't enjoy the food just as food, right? And you don't give in to your just natural instincts and impulses as the goal, right? The goal is always to glorify God, to live for God, to live on the basis of the eternal. You do have to eat to serve, stay alive. That's good. But um, that's not your main emotion, right? Uh, celebrating eating is not good. <laughs> this is the guilt, right? This is a society based on guilt. Um, that your natural impulses are inferior to your drive for the eternal. Um, and then how this, it, not, the next point I wanna make is that both Islam and Christianity do think that God intervenes in history. And so the huge problems we have in Israel with the Palestinians versus the Israelis, both of those sides think that their holy books tell them that God wanted them, you know, this is their holy place right here, like the Dome of the Rock. 
And so, so it is important because this is still driving a whole lot of stuff that goes on in this world. When I was in Indonesia, um, my students, right away, one of them said, how come Obama is not condemning Israel, you know? And so we've got the whole world like siding with the Palestinians or siding with the Israelis. And the whole conflict has to do with having these two different holy books and these two different quotes in each holy book about God's intervention in history. So, I mean, in AUW is not based on this stuff, right? <laughs> the foundation of the institution, AUW, is not, is not related to this, but I think you, AUW would want everyone to learn this stuff because you learn it in order to understand the world you live in. So um, Augustine does talk about God's intervention. So in the confession, he talks about it in his personal life. Then he talks about it in history, that the Romans, they, all they cared about was this world. They got their reward until they got so corrupt. And then the Christians took over. And even though Christians sometimes get martyred and killed, that doesn't matter because they get their reward in heaven. And so it all balances out. Um, let's see, God's intervention in human lives. I've talked about that. Um, okay, so that's, that's yeah. Professor, I'm curious to know that whether Augustine follow any specific religious like Islam or Christianity. Oh, he's Christian. Could the idea is similar to the... Yeah, oh, okay. he's Christian, but you know, my students, uh, there's a lot more Muslims than Christians among my students. But what I want you to think about is on the surface, Christians and Mu Muslims have a lot of animosity underneath that. <laughs> When you think about yeah, yeah. basic tenets, what they think and how they think, it's very similar and the kinds of questions that people in each religion ask. So, so I'm glad, you know, if you can understand that, that these are, these are questions you would ask if your basic premise is that there's one God and that God intervenes in people's lives and intervenes in history and there's these holy books, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, that express God's relation to human beings. And so even though the religions are at odds, they, act, they have very, very similar philosophies. So that's what I wanted to get at with this. Um, and then, when, okay, good. When I have students and, and starting next time, so I think What's going to happen is that in this class, we're going to end with my lecture and maybe a few student questions. But at the beginning of the next class, I will probably summarize this for 10 minutes and then I'll put you into groups. And from now on, that's how we'll do it. We'll have like the first hour be on Augustine after you've assimilated some of this stuff. And then the second two hours will be on Aquinas, the next step. So for next time, I want you to at least start your post, finish your post on spiritual humanism, get that one done. Then start your post on Augustine, okay? And you can revise it after the next class and read the stuff on Aquinas. Just read it over. I will give you again, I will hand you a lot more documents than I will ask you to read, all right? I'll be very specific about, okay, here's six documents, read, you know, this one. I'm gonna give you a Martin Luther King Jr letter it's about black it it's about his movement uh the civil rights movement and 
but it refers to, it's very consistent with St. Thomas Aquinas. So I'll have you reading a few pages of that. Um, anyway, that's, that's where we're going. So for next time, post, finish and post the Aristotle Seneca for sure. Start your reactions. You can post them or not, it doesn't matter, but just get written down stuff about Augustine. And then for next time, we will wrap up Augustine and you will need to post that two days after class. And we will start Aquinas and you just start thinking about it, maybe jotting notes down on your own. Um, and then, okay, that's how we're gonna work it. So here's the basic format that I would like, um, I remember having students that were Hindu and Buddhist and secularist in my classes at AUW last year, whenever that was. And, um, you know, the Hindus think this is nuts, right? This is, I never think about this stuff. But that's what's interesting is that how differently human beings get conditioned to think of good and evil and justice and injustice. But in spite of how differently you get conditioned, you can still talk about it. You can find your common humanity. You can find this desire to understand and you can start talking to each other, all right? There is a way to have a foundation. And that's what I want to get at because I'm, I'm one of those spiritual humanist types. I think it's really crazy to think that we can't find a way to get along because we can. Um, whether or not you think God wants us to, we can because God created us that way or we can because evolution, we're all ultimately tied to evolution we have the same natural roots is fine. I really don't care. All I care is that you that you do figure out you can get along. Okay, so the problem of evil. First of all, you can prove the existence of free will. The eternal is more powerful than the temporal. Our reason understands the eternal. We should always be acting on the basis of the eternal. We don't. Why not? free will. That's how you literally prove that there's such a thing as free will. I think it's really tricky. I mean, I think it's really ingenious. Um, so evil is a misuse of free will because we're given the handbook. We have reason. Free will is good because when people use it, they become happy and there's righteousness. Um, but it always has to. So even God cannot create free will and then not allow people to choose evil, right? You can't do that. <laughs> then it's not free will anymore. So part of free will means allowing people, giving them that option, no matter how bad it is. Nobody had to sin, right? When God created free will, nobody had any sort of moral obligation to sin. Um, as long as sinners are unhappy, the universe is perfect. What is evil? It's the turning away of the soul from the eternal to the temporal. God didn't create it. God's foreknowledge. God can foreknow what people choose. We can't. It makes no sense to us, so we have to believe it. And um, if God foreknew, didn't God cause it? No. Um, God's intervention in history uh, and God's intervention in human life. So, so if some of you are Muslim and you want to sort of sort all this out and that's of interest to you, that's what you can do in your post. If this is of no interest at all, <laughs> um, or if you just want to, if you want to give your 10 reasons why you think this is stupid, give your 10 reasons for why you think that, you know? I really want each of you to work it out in your own way. And I hope, I hope that after 
seeing these two points of view, you can understand why it's so important to me that I don't tell you what you have to think because it's so important that you work things out in your own mind and come to know what you think. Um, and, I, and also, I don't think, I don't want to teach it as well. It's just a matter of fact that Aristotle thinks this and Augustine thinks that. That's not true. People get invested in these points of view, right? People are driven from these points. These are not morally neutral. This is not we shouldn't be detached observers. We should understand and we should want to be engaged and we should want to live a good life. And so we should care about whether we think these are good ideas for living a good life. And if you think it's, you know, this is what, this is what I like about this idea. This is what I don't like about this idea. That's really starting to think. So, um, when I used to dress up like each person, I would, you know, leave the students and they had no idea what I thought. Um, I even taught the Pope telling them they couldn't use birth control and they didn't even know if I agreed with that or not. <laughs> and then I talked about Hitler. I dressed up like Hitler and they didn't even know I didn't agree with Hitler. So, um, so, I do want right for you to get to be to understand it, but then to be able, oh yeah, the students got to a certain point where they said, well, Professor Beck, I don't agree with any of them completely. And I was like, good, now you're thinking, now you're thinking. So just by juxtaposing these two points of view, there's no way you can agree with both of them, right? So <laughs> then, you, you know, I don't want you to go, I'm whole hog over here and this is just awful. Um, you could just, I do want you to start thinking, you know, and even if you don't like Augustine, you can say, no matter what I think of it, I think it has a lot of influence. And this is how I think it has influence. Does that make sense? Um, and you could say, you know, you could say it's not a bad opinion. It's just the people that follow these opinions are bad, right? And they've made it into this weapon. So on the one hand, I gave you that news article about this woman who was raised with a view like this and how she thought it was psychologically crippling, right? Because ultimately we're talking about a healthy psyche. So do you think a healthy psyche is one that's driven by this view of the eternal over the temporal, right? Or do you think that's really unhealthy and it makes people psychologically sick, <laughs> right? It's just not healthy to deny or to denigrate your natural self, or it really enables you to develop yourself as a rational being, all right? so. Those are the kinds of distinctions I want you to make in your post. Just say, oh my gosh, it's complicated. And ideas are powerful. That's my ultimate thing. No matter how perverted you might th think this is, it certainly has had an effect on human history. And there are plenty of people who believe it. You might have, you might want to say in your post, this is what my family believes or what my neighbors believe. This is why my neighbors think I'm going to hell because I'm going to college, right? You know, whatever you want to think, um, I'm happy to uh, read it. And next time I'm going to put you into groups and you can tell each other, right? How you reacted to it. I hope it starts getting to be exciting and everybody starts to know they've got skin in the game, okay? Philosophy isn't just this disembodied ideas. Um, so any other questions? So you guys can start leaving. Um, and if anybody wants to ask a question and hang out for extra, you know, I will, I'll be here until everybody's questions are answered.
Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Professor. Goodbye. Bye bye. I hope I hope I've clarified some of the confusion about the class. Professor, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Anybody else? Question? Yeah. Um, Professor, my first question is, um, so we talked about how religions can influence how people think, right? Right. And, and as a result, they can control societies. My question is, how did people retain in those specific cultures that are over controlled by certain ideas, how did they as a people retain the ability to think for themselves or retain the ability to critically think and be rational? Well, I mean, Aristotle would say it's because it's natural. Anybody who knows what a two-year-old, you know, the terrible twos, is when kids figure out that they're different from their parents, right? And that they actually have choices, right? So, so okay, the explanation for Aristotle is that by nature, we are the creature that's capable of understanding, right? And so we collectively realized that we have to constantly evaluate whether or not our choices are developing our humanity. So he would say that we naturally can figure out that we have a common humanity and that some choices we make encourage flourishing and some choices discourage it. And we can figure that out collectively and we can pass on our wisdom to the next generation. That's what wisdom means, the ability to recognize the pattern. And then the poets and the artists, the intellectuals tell stories that try to encourage people to do what's been proven over time. Okay. Um, and then let's see, Augustine would say that God implanted these ideas, right? They're innate ideas. So even a little kid, you know, they'll say you cut a piece of pie and it's not exactly the same size. They go, that's not fair, right? Well, where do they get at that idea of fair, right? That's what Augustine would say, because, you know, it didn't come from their experience necessarily at all, but they just have this thing. That's not fair. Do you see what I mean? I mean, there are for this um, and uh, and the parents can mess with kids too right if a so according to augustine a parent who would say life ain't fair so put up and shut up is that's bad parenting right because god gave us i mean parents should always lead their kid toward these eternal right understanding that there are these eternal truths like it's always wrong to hit your brother or whatever right that goes against god's will okay so um so even though these these ideas were planted by god you have to raise your kid to be consciously aware of those ideas does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. It's better if someone else goes and they can ask my next question. Okay. Who, who else would like to ask a question? Uh, professor, uh, professor, I just wanted to ask you some stuff about the, um, the course itself and the curriculum since this is my first class today. 
So, but I, I think that can wait till the end of it. We could just finish through the discussions if uh, everyone else is done with their questions. Okay, okay, sounds good. Maywish, did you have a question? Maybe she's not there. Nashiba, did you have a question? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, but it's it's not about today's class specifically, but like um, I wanted to ask you about a problem I might have uh, in July. So basically, I'm uh, supposed to travel somewhere um, around uh, the third week of July. And I just wanted to ask that if I don't attend classes, maybe like two classes, like one week, would it be much of a problem? Uh, because like I, I can do the homeworks, but I'm afraid I won't be able to attend the live classes. So if, if that's a problem, maybe I would have to opt for an independent study instead. So yeah, I just wanted to be clear about that. Okay, so um, it's it's okay with me. Um, you just go online. So what you what you would do is on your posts, you would I mean, because you have to post every day, I you know, obviously you have to read the stuff. You, we have recordings, whoops, I, I gotta stop this recording. <laughs> okay, 